really excited to be here with Tara. So Tara, who is going to be quizzing me earlier on, is probably the most thoughtful writer about food that I've met in the kind of, since I joined the board at DEFRA and uh, worked on the National Food Strategy. And if you want to get under any particular topic on food, Tara has been ceaselessly producing um, these, if you have, it's true, like so really not. If you want to know what regenerative agriculture is or means or all the ways in which it's defined, when I started off trying to get to grips with meat and these kind of issues, Tara produces these extraordinary um, things. So a lot of this, the thinking was thanks to Tara, and I'm looking forward to sitting down. And, and really, I'll just I'll start asking her questions. Um, I thought what, what, what I was going to talk through, so the, um, the book, Ravenous, is, is based, it's kind of reworking of the National Food Strategy, which was some work I was commissioned to do for government and published in uh, July 2021. My wife, uh, Jemima Lewis, had uh, in her free time edited with me, worked for hours and hours and hours for free, helping me turn the food strategy into something that could hopefully be understood by uh, human beings rather than just policy wonks. Uh, but w as soon as we published, you know, we were trying to do two things. We were trying to change the way in which people understood how the food system worked because pretty much everything people understand about how the food system works is wrong and you can't create change unless... Hey, Charles. Unless... Uh, it, you can't create change unless people understand how the system's gone wrong. Uh, and then secondly, we were trying to recommend some policies. And as soon as we published it, I was like... The more important, I turned to my wife and said, the more important thing uh, here is actually the stories, and no one sane is going to go onto a government website and download a government document, so we're going to have to turn this into a book. And if you do it with me again, you can get your name on the cover this time for the first time. She's actually done another government book with me. She's slightly disappointed about the relative sizes of the fonts, <laughs> but, um, but I, I left that to the publisher. I didn't get involved. So I thought, you know, what I do is I'll just very briefly tell the story that we tell in the book. And the story that we tell in the book starts in uh, 1945. It starts after the Second World War when there were 2.5 billion people on the planet, more than at any point in human history, despite all the bloodshed. And scientists at the time were looking at uh, the projections of what the human population might grow to based on what they knew about likely improvements in medicine and in sanitation. And the kind of broad consensus was that the population of the planet was going to grow to about 8 to 10 billion people over the next 50 or so years. And this created a problem because since the Holocene, the period of stable climate that started in about 10,000 BC, when the human population had grown, we had simply dug up more land and planted more crops. And what these scientists spotted was that we had run out of land. There was no more land to dig up. And so if you look at the the newspapers of the late 40s and the early 50s, you see that the running theme of this kind of Malthusian uh, disaster that was awaiting the human race is a repeated theme. It's repeated as often as um, nuclear war was in my childhood, this idea that we had run out of resources, we were going to run out of food, our population was going to be curtailed in decades of starvation and, and misery. What the scientists hadn't banked on was a botanist named Norman Borlaug. He's probably the most, the most kind of important person that very few people, some of you, if you work in food, will have heard of him, but very few people have ever heard of. In the book, we, we say that if there'd been a biopic of him, he would have been played by Jimmy Stewart because he, had, he was very handsome. He had a kind of long chin and good American teeth. But... but um, no one, made a, no one made a film of his life because you don't get famous by uh, stopping bad things happen. And what Borlaug did, he'd grown up in, the, in Idaho in the Great Depression. He'd seen food riots close up. He set a kind of lifetime mission to improve people's diets. He ended up in Mexico at the end of the Second World War. Uh, he was working for the Rockefeller Foundation. And he'd arrived, when he arrived, he wrote to his wife and said that the, the quality of the soil is so poor these people are just scraping a living. They're just getting by. We need to do something. I don't know what we, need, we should do, but we need to do something. And what he did was he bred a new form of wheat. He set up two research stations, one at the sea, sea level, one in the mountains, so he could breed 
uh, two crops every year, and painstakingly he took essentially three, he had this idea that if he took a, a short stem wheat from Japan that was very low yielding, but he'd heard about <laughs> it and he wrote to the Japanese scientists who were working on it saying, can you send me some ste seeds? He wanted to cross that with a high yielding American wheat that was so heavy headed that on long stems, if the wind blew, it all blew over, it lodged, so you lost your crop, with another uh, form of wheat that was resistant to wheat rust. And he, with one or two assistants, and he occasionally roped in some Mexicans, he scampered between the sea and the mountains, literally snipping off the little florets of the wheat by hand, tapping off the pollen into little paper envelopes that he'd make, and then s stapling those on top of other wheats. And um, by the end of the war, he had been successful. He created a new form of wheat. Uh, he gave this to the most popular farmers he knew, Mexican farmers. They planted it because he was worried that if it came from the gringo, then no one would accept it. They planted it. Uh, it completely, when combined with um, Harbour Bosch created fertilizer and modern irrigation techniques, it transformed Mexican agriculture. Mexico went it from importing half its wheat to by the time he left in 1960 to exporting wheat. And this experiment was repeated for rice and for maize across the world in what ironically became known as the Green Revolution. And if you look at uh, this chart shows um, from 1800 to today, the green line is the amount of uh, land we farmed, the, the black line is the human population, and the red line is the number of calories we produce globally. And... Where am I pointing it out? I'm back there. And, the, um, uh, and the, the scientists were right. Population did increase. We hit 8 billion recently. Total agricultural land has actually fallen when, when the Soviet Union fell apart um, or finally collapsed. A lot of land that was collectivized fell out of production. But we now produce almost twice the number of calories for each of those 8 billion people that we produced back in 1945 for 2.5 billion people. It's one of the great human uh, success stories, great stories of innovation. But when you uh, focus just on one thing in solving a complex system, and Borlaug was unashamedly just focusing on how many calories can I get out of a square meter of land, you can cause other problems. And as a lot of you will know, uh, but actually, funny enough, most of the general public don't, the food system is responsible for two of the, uh, of the great problems of the Western world. The first is that this system has come to completely dominate our environment, the biosphere. It is by far the biggest cause of the destruction of biodiversity. It's the biggest cause of freshwater stress, freshwater pollution, deforestation, the collapse of aquatic life, and after energy, it's the biggest cause of climate change. And one way of looking at quite how dominant the food system has become is to look at the total weight uh, of wild animals defined as land-dwelling vertebrates and birds. This is at the beginning of the Holocene, 10,000 BC, 2.5 million people on the planet, dwarfed by um, mammals, large and small, other uh, vertebrates and birds. If you fast forward to today, you see a very different system to the same scale. So... You can see on the right, that little uh, blue circle has grown to 8 billion people. Uh, those uh, wild animals have significantly decreased, uh, initially due probably to our enthusiastic hunting of megafauna, but even since 1970, for example, as wheat yields in this country have doubled, we have lost half of our farmland birds. In fact, the horses, dogs and cats... Uh, the green circles weigh almost as much now as all wild animals. And the animals that we rear to eat, 80 billion of them we slaughter every year, at any one time weigh twice as much as all of the people on the planet and 20 times as much as all of the wild animals. And the consequences of this are terrifying. So this is the single chart that I found the most disturbing for all of the work that we did for government and in writing the book. And it shows it's been done separately by the UN and by NASA. I think this is the UN version. And what they've tried to do is look at what yields, crop yields might look like 
in a 2.5 degree climate change scenario. And what you see is across the northern hemisphere, you have this big band of green. That's increased crop yields, uh, increased wheat yields in particular. Wheat loves carbon dioxide. It's a great feedstock. So increased carbon dioxide levels are good and a little bit of extra warmth helps. And what you see in the equatorial and southern hemisphere is decreased maize and rice yields. And those decreases, decreases might, come, um, might come gradually or they might be sudden. So, for example, um, the, the Mekong Delta, which is the biggest rice exporter to the world, if you raise sea levels by a metre, half of that will be underwater. And my, my wife, described this as... You know, the way that we produce food is imperiling the way that we produce food. The way we produce food may make us not able to feed ourselves. And this chart just looks to me like starvation, warfare, and mass migration. And it's not just the environment that, uh, that this, this new food system is destroying. It's our bodies. This is the, uh, the, the years of life lost to ill health and death thanks to different non-communicable factors. And diet is now overwhelmingly the biggest destroyer of health, far out outweighing tobacco and alcohol use. And it's getting much worse. By 2035, uh, it's projected that the NHS will be spending more just treating type 2 diabetes alone than it does uh, today on treating all cancers. Chris Whitty, who was quite busy during lockdown, was making online lectures to anyone who would listen, geeks like me, in his spare time about the damage that diet was going to do to the health service when we came out of this. And Andy Haldane, the, governor, the, the, the former chief economist at the Bank of England, um, made a speech about three, four, four weeks ago now where he described ill health, non-communicable disease, as being the single thing holding back our economy. 2.5 million people out of work at the moment, more than ever... Uh, most of those are either suffering from diseases that are made worse by poor diet or direct diet-related diseases. And so what that looks like, if you play it forward in 10 years' time, whoever is in power is going to be, if we don't do something about it, is going to be looking at a state that all the money is being sucked into the NHS because we can't let that fall down, tax receipts are low, and we become impoverished and sick. This is the point in the book, this is about kind of midway through where people ring me up and say, does it get any better? <laughs> uh, but it does, there, there is a way through. And if you, if you, um, if you uh, ever get the chance to do an independent review for government, in, I would do it. I would do it. In many ways, it is a living hell. Uh, and as Tara will, um, will say, if you have any view on the food system, you get attacked for being a an ultra-vegan for being a meat lover, for being... I mean, it's just like everyone is angry. But the great thing about doing government review is you can, you can ring up anyone in the world, and literally during lockdown, which is when we were working, anyone in the world, you could get on Zoom, the cleverest people on any topic, discussing how you might go about solving these problems. And the first thing we did was we asked people, lots of people, how they would approach this. And they said, everyone said, well, you need to take a systems approach. And you need to take a systems approach. What's a systems approach? Like, what does that look like? And that we've got quite different uh, points of view. And we often got uh, uh, shown this chart. I, I checked this yesterday. So if you Google um, spiders on drugs, which I, I strongly recommend you do. Have you ever seen spiders? I knew you would have seen spiders on drugs. So if you Google spiders on drugs, there's a whole like, community of scientists who give spiders drugs and then look at the webs they make. And there's actually now, new, newly released, there's a Wall Street Journal quiz where they show the picture of the web and then you have to guess what spider was, what drug the spider was on that made the web. And it's, it's, actually easy, it's actually quite easy. I, th I reckon you'll get 100% first time around because like, the spider who's on dope just does about three lazy webs and then gives up. And the spider on acid does these incredible fractal patterns. <laughs> um, and, and this one looks like the spider. It's almost identical to the web of the spider on speed. 
Um, and it's, it, it, what it purports to show, it's called the Foresight Obesity Map, it's quite famous in the field, and it purports to show all of the things that make us uh, obese. Our background, our genetics, our, the economics, etc., etc., etc. And it is very good for showing that it's complicated, but it is not very helpful either if you're trying to solve the problem or, if, importantly, if you're trying to tell politicians that you want like, how they might think about the problem. Because they look at this and they just go, you know, I'll do something easy like small boats or, you know, something I can just shout about. The, the other chart that we were often shown was this one, which actually is really important. Uh, this is uh, a chart by a woman called Kelly Parsons, and it, she mapped the response... These are all the government departments. She mapped the responsibilities for food across all the government departments, and responsibility for food is spread like you know, jam on toast, very thin jam on toast, across government departments. And this is a problem. So, for example, uh, Boris Johnson was going to do an advertising ban for junk food to children, very popular policy. And I was... The first meeting I had when I was in DEFRA, I was asked to take was with ITV. And ITV said, well, first of all, advertising doesn't work. It's like, you know, you might, you might be careful about who you, who you say that to. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you won't have any children's TV programs, and then the food companies are telling DEFRA, well, you know, we're a big part of the economy, it's going to hurt us, and so by the time that gets to number 10, you've got the Department for Culture, Media and Sport with ITV in their ear saying, no, this is going to be a disaster for children's programs, DEFRA defending the food companies, and only the Department for Health having to clear up the mess, and you need in that situation, a strong and stable number 10. Anything that re requires complex system change requires that. And when I was the lead non-exec at DEFRA, we, we, had, we went up and downhill to Brexit four times, to no-deal Brexit, followed by COVID, followed by Ukraine, followed by Truss. Uh, I, had, I had five secretaries of states and four prime ministers in that time. So that is not the kind of environment in which you can make sensible, complicated um, policy uh, interventions. But this isn't the reason the food system is failing. This is why it's hard to fix it. The, the person who, first of all, kind of pointed us in the direction of how we should try and take this on was uh, Ian Boyd, who is a... He's a biologist. He studies energy circulation in environmental systems, which is basic when it gets down to it, like which plants take the sun and then what eats what and how it's circulated. But what is interesting is that the science that he used, which is system dynamics, as he pointed out to us, actually is one of the few scientists that's, sciences that's come from business. It was developed at MIT for business systems. And all of these complex systems, whether it's a business, whether it is a biological system, have similar patterns, similar ways of going wrong, and, uh, and they are dominated. When they go wrong, it's normally because a feedback loop is going wrong. And so what he said is, you have to look at what are the minimum viable feedback loops that you can spot that are making the system wrong, because unless you break those, you're not going to stand a chance of fixing the system. And luckily in the food system, there are two feedback loops that are going really obviously very badly wrong. The first is what we call the junk food cycle, and this is simply the fact that we have an appetite that evolved at a time when calories were scarce, and it is scientifically the case that if you eat food that is calorie-dense, that is low in insoluble fiber, that is low in water, that is soft in texture, you eat more of it and you get full less quickly than if you eat other kinds of foods. And it now seems the case that actually with ultra-processed food, we don't know enough about it, but there are certain ratios of fat to sugar to salt that give really strong reward mechanisms to our brain. That don't, those ratios don't exist in normal food. And what food companies have spotted, not because they're evil and they want to kill us, but simply that's what was making the money, is that uh, this food sells. It's more easy to sell this food than it is other food. You know, there are until Nestle introduced Kit Kat breakfast cereal into this country a few weeks ago, there were 28 different kinds of Kit Kat in this country. There are now 29 that you can buy, you know, maybe like one, two kinds of kale if you're lucky. 
And that's because we will spend more money on this. And that is what is known as um, an escalating feedback loop. We eat more, they spend more, we eat more, they spend more, we get sick. And if you look at just one example, the scale of this, we spend £2.2 .2 billion on fresh vegetables in this country every year and £3.9 billion on confectionery, which is just one category of this stuff. 85% of the foods sold by the biggest top 16 uh, processed food companies are deemed by the World Health Organization to be uh, are too unhealthy to market to children. And we may be talking about this. We argued that you, break, you, you, need to, you definitely need to break this feedback loop. But the feedback loop exists between uh, two, there are two sides to it. One is our appetite, and one is the commercial incentives of companies. We argued strongly that you should tackle the latter. I think we may end up drugging a third of our population uh, because it may be too difficult to, the politicians may find it too difficult to, uh, to tackle the commercial incentives of companies. And so you'll just see a shift of money from, from the uh, food companies to pharma companies as we change our appetites. The other feedback loop that's going wrong is actually was uh, coined by uh, a great man called Parthidas Gupta. He wrote a 600-page work of genius, The Economics of Biodiversity for Treasury, and he pointed out that not only was nature quite hard to measure, so it's often silent, it's invisible, it's underground, underwater, and it's mobile, it, it doesn't respect borders or the kinds of spaces that we'd like to put it in, but also... Uh, we, we don't see its value in any of the systems that we use or most of the systems that we use to measure human success. So you can't count nature in your wallet. It's not in the balance sheet of companies. It's not in uh, the way in which we measure GDP. And in fact, he says, he points out that it's worse than that. We spend, according to Dask Gupta, uh, about $500 billion a year subsidizing activities that destroy nature, industrial farming, fishing, uh, and energy primarily. So we're giving nature a negative cost. And this is, this is good news because it, we shouldn't be surprised that we're destroying nature if we're literally paying billions of dollars a year. It's not just that it's free, we're paying billions of dollars a year. Das Gupta's report, by the way, the civil servants, uh, have you read the whole thing? No. So the civil servants tried to make him do a summary and he was like, no, 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 no. This is, this is it. It's like, like, it's like going and asking Tolstoy to do a summary of Anna Karenina. And in the end, they kind of forced him to do a 120-page summary. Uh, and then they said, well, 120 pages, you know, they had to have a summary. And then he was like, no, 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 no. Anyway, so they did a five-page or ten-page summary, which is just not worth reading. I'm afraid to say you have to read. It's not worth reading Anna Karenina or Abridged. You have to read the 600 pages. But if you do that, you will be rewarded with things like... The, one of the first things that Tara and I ever talked about was... Uh, is it possible to have uh, economic growth, you know, unlimited economic growth? And Parthed asked Gupta, you know, and the answer to that is, if you believe in uh, uh, coal fusion, yes, theoretically it is. There's a 10-page a, a chapter in the book where Das Gupta actually shows does it, how much nature we are degrading for each percentage of economic growth that that we are creating, so how much nature we're mining, and shows that you have to be just wildly optimistic to believe that we could ever continue the rate of economic growth we have now without... Uh, and he projects, like, different, different rates, like, our extinction dates. Absolutely amazing stuff. Strongly recommend it. But probably go for the spiders on acid first. Um, so, so those are the feedback loops that are going wrong. Um, if you want to fix... The second one, the invisibility of nature, you basically have to realise that for most of human history until the late 18th century, we got everything that we produced from the action of, pretty much from the action of sunlight on the land, whether it was energy, clothes, transport, building materials, we, we grew it, or we got it from things that grew. Uh, and then we discovered millions of years of buried sunlight in the form of fossil fuels, and we basically then only needed the land for food. Now we are asking much more of our land. Uh, we need our land for energy, for food, to restore biodiversity, to sequester carbon. And it is actually possible, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a simultaneous equation. Can you solve for 
enough food, enough biodiversity, enough carbon? And the answer is you can because the way in which we use food, use our land at the moment, is profligate. This is a map of uh, the area of land used to feed us in the UK. And what you'll notice is that, uh, first of all, those hexagons on the right are land abroad. So we feed ourselves off about almost twice the area of land mass of the UK. And then this is kind of what's being done with that land. So these are peat bogs. They, they, actually, most of them, some of them are down here. Most of them are up there. Um, built up areas, only about 6% of our, of our land. And then, mo and then golf courses up there. Golf courses significantly larger than orchards and about the same size as the amount of land put aside to fruit and veg. But 85% of this land is used either to rear animals or to rear food to feed to animals. And we can solve this problem, but we need, there is no way of doing it without eating less meat. And people talk about meat as being about health. It is kind of, but it's not really. They talk of it about being about methane. Yes, that's important, but really the reason we need to eat less meat is because we need some of that land back. So we then set in the food strategy and in the book um, some very high-level targets about what a food system might look like if it were to be healthy and sustainable. And we'd need to eat about 30% more veg, about 50% more fiber, 25% um, less junk food, and by 2030, 30% less meat, probably about 50% less meat, depending on what else happens by 2050. And we set out a bunch of policy recommendations, which we may or may not talk about, about how you do that. And I just wanted to end by saying, we, we start the book by saying, uh, you know, you, we are, in some ways, we, we like to think of ourselves of having free will, but we're actually stuck in this huge machine that is the food system that tugs us back and forth. And that machine is everything from the way in which we farm to the way in which uh, Deliveroo is marketed to us or the bog-offs in the supermarket. These all pulling at our behavior. Um, but because we end up by saying, because we're a cog in the machine, we can move it. And government intervention of these, for, for these feedback loops, to break these feedback loops, is necessary, it's critical, but it is not enough. It's not sufficient. I did another piece of work for government back in 2013, the school food plan, which ended up with, among other things, universal free school meals for infants. It also ended up with the most brilliant, written by me and my wife, food curriculum for children in schools in the UK that is theoretically compulsory up to the age of 14. I go into schools all the time, so I set up a charity on the back of that that helps improve food education and cooking in schools. Most schools I go into are still either not doing it or just cooking cupcakes. And that's because you can't just pass laws and expect things to happen. Things happen because people care and people decide, a head teacher decides to make a difference. So the, uh, many of you may be working in the food system, so you may already be making your difference. But if you're not, I just implore you just to look at the system around you, the things that are happening around you, and think about, is there one little thing that you can do in your community to improve the food system? That might be the greatest activity of all time, going and having a lunch in a school with your child or grandchild. Well, it's great in, in primary school. In secondary school, they're very embarrassed. But, it's, um, but that simple act of turning up for a school lunch can be the trigger, often has been the trigger that changed the food. It might be cooking with your godchild or your a friend's child or your grandchildren or your children. It might be as simple as trying to reduce the amount of, you, of meat that you eat in your house by 30%. That's giving up meat twice a, twice a week if you, if you eat it every day. Because those things, while small, those little moments of care, we need thousands and thousands and millions of them because passing laws um, isn't, isn't going to cut it on its own. Thank you. Tara, do you, do you want to sit there or here? This one's higher. Why don't you sit on the higher one? Is it higher or is it just where I was standing? Um, I think there's... No, I just, just, okay. just well, perspective. I'm, I'm there you go. Okay. okay. Um, and, uh, Rosie, you're going to keep an eye on the time, aren't you? Because I've got no I idea what the time is.
Right. You're not going to use mics, have you? Can, right. can you hear us with our voices? Do you, okay. Oh, we need to use it for the, for okay. the film. Yeah, okay. So that was, that was a great talk, and it was a fantastic articulation of the problems and the interconnections among the problems. Now, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is that, I mean, you and I have been working on food for a very long time, and um, I dug out a report I wrote back in 1994, quite recently, and the articulation of the problems were the same. The only difference is that the numbers have gone up and the numbers have got worse, and so many people said the same thing for so long and nothing changes. And why? Well, so I think, interestingly, I think that some things are beginning to change. Um, so I think that nothing, you know, there is a lot of grit in the cogs of change. And I think that is partly because, as I said, the general public doesn't understand that, what a big problem the food system is. And when it comes to health, most people, and this is statistically the case from surveys, most people buy the line of the Sun newspaper that if they are sick, it's because they don't have willpower and they're too lazy. And so there's a lot of this uh, uh, talk of kind of personal responsibility. And so you combine the fact, therefore, what, and some of the interventions of government are quite hard. So what is, the, you know, what is in it for me as a politician if, um, if, these, if, if people don't and think it's my time, fault? Yeah, and the lead time. It's not going to materialise no. within a particular exactly. government Exactly. Period. Complex. So, yeah. so uh, uh, and that is actually, I think that's why... If you look at climate change, you know, the most important thing about the Stern report was putting in two things, statutory targets, and then secondly, an independent body, the Climate Change Committee, which held the government account every year, which has kept climate change, you know, up, up there. And if you look at things like, for example, the E, the, uh, despite what Rowan Atkinson said, in the Guardian the other day, actually the electric vehicle transition, we're ahead of schedule. I'm almost certain that we won't be selling any new EV cars by 2030. And that's huge. It's a massive thing. So so why so so then you've got that stickiness. So why why am I optimistic now? Yeah. So I think two things. First of all, I think that on the biodiversity and climate side, there is now an understanding on both sides of the political divide that food is a problem. And there's a, there in particular, on the conservative side, there's a thing called the Conservative Environment Network, where they... It's, it's, it's really the kind of... So 20 years ago, most conservative politicians, other than Margaret Thatcher, would have denied there was climate change, so certainly wouldn't have thought about biodiversity. This little group just got a pledge, which all basically said was, please sign this pledge to say it's a problem. And now the majority of Conservative members of Parliament have signed that. And so when they left Europe, the, the, you, know, there's a, you and I know there's a lot wrong with it, but basically the pr approach that's been set out to change our agriculture is the right one. And I don't think that the Labour Party, if they come in, will change that. So I think we've kind of got to critical mass. There's lots can go wrong between now and then. On health, something really interesting has happened, I think, in the last year or two years. So I think the Andy Haldane thing has been a huge... It's had real resonance. And in Treasury, they've started to look at the health figures. So we've got a very... At the moment, we've got a very ideological uh, Secretary of State for Health. Doesn't believe in public health. Basically, you know, it's about making the NHS efficient and won't accept that, you know, however inefficient you make the NHS, you, it will not be able to cope with the number of sick bodies we're throwing at it. But I think in Treasury... The treasury machine, not just the politicians. Jeremy Hunt, obviously, remember, was health sector. I think they have kind of clocked it as being a major problem. And then in the Labour Party, they were making noises about six months ago about we don't want to, you know, they were, we don't want to be nanny state, we don't want to upset the red wall. But there's been a very clear change of tack from Wes Streeting recently. And so I think that just, you know, it's not the best way to begin to solve the problem. But as you said, what's the difference? The difference is the numbers are bigger. 
And I just think we're getting to a stage where the numbers are so big that it is going to start to be impossible on the health side not to do things. Yeah, so, so I just want to ask two questions sort of, to, sort of following on from that. So, um, so one is, one is you, 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 know, you mentioned in your analysis that there are all these government departments and there are all these kind of com competing and conflicting interests when it comes to doing anything within government departments. Um, but you sort of, you outlined that there is a role for government, even if it's not the only thing that needs to be done. And then you talked about the fact that, you know, we all as um, not just citizens, just consumers, but also as citizens in our, in our various identities can and should be doing things. But the other element is, is the corporate sector, the businesses. And, and I always hear two kind of very conflicting accounts about businesses and I think they can they can both be true so on the one hand you go and talk to at least some of the more enlightened ones and they say we need regulation we need the kind of proverbial level playing field um, it just just set set the framework and we are happy to try and do something um, but then you hear you know you hear about the Kit Kat cereal and you hear about all the um, opposition to things like um, the kind of the bog offs that have just been ditched again, and um, and advertising regulations, and the kind of the, the kind of infinite new product developments that are going in the wrong direction. So, why do we have this kind of left hand, right hand, you know, approach to, to thinking about these things? So, in terms of corporates, I mean, my I've changed my view really. So, there there are some who talk a good game. There are some who even do good things. So, for example, recently Danone, the, the president of Danone, said one of our recommendations was a salt and sugar reformulation tax. She said that we, they needed this. They won't be able to change. Uh, Tesco have said that they will not be putting bog-offs on junk food unilaterally. So there are some good things going on. The, the, the CEO of Nestle came up to me at a thing the other day and said, what can I do? You know, what can I do? And I said, well, actually, I, uh, this is because my view chance. There's lots you can do on environment. I actually don't think there is much you can do, and I don't think there's much they can do on health because, because they are stuck in this junk food cycle. If, if you know, That's if 85% yeah. of your portfolio, yeah. portfolio, you've got these huge factories. You know, I, I said to him, I, don't, I think, you know, you could maybe not lobby against it. But then that was, and literally, the next Wednesday, they released... Kit Kat cereal. And on the website for the Kit Kat cereal, it said, Kit Kat cereal, tasty and nutritious. And then there was a star on the nutritious. And I was like, oh, hello, hello. Yeah. So you went all the way down to the bottom of the website that said nutritious contains vitamin B12. And uh, the, I got a t I, I tweeted, oh, for fuck's sake, Nestle, come on. I mean, at least, and I, I, wrote, I wrote, I said, no, you know, not much you can do. You could actually try, you know, don't be actively wicked. And uh, uh, the CEO of a, a former CEO of a supermarket texted me. Uh, he's on my tweet. And he said, Henry, look at the Nestle mission statement. What you'll notice is that Nestle mission statement is to be the number one provider of nutritious food to the world. I bet you that there is a checklist that they have to do when they launch a new product. And one of them says, is it on mission? So they had to put nutritious Otherwise, it wouldn't have been on mission. And then he said, look at the portion size. Yeah, it's the portion size. But this, this, was even, this was even worse at the same. So he portion. said, like, normally we did research. People eat between 50 and 80 grams of, of cereal uh, in their portion size. The standard thing with uh, breakfast companies, they say 40 grams, because that means that not all the traffic lights are red. The Nestle Kit Kat cereal was 30 grams because they couldn't even do that without, they, in order not to have all the traffic lights red. So that kind of thing, I think, is just, you know... But I do think, in the end, that is not... You know, there will always be someone who is less, uh, who, who cares less, or who who's just, you know, believes that I'm, I'm just going to make a buck. So I think that does need government intervention. I'm, more, I'm stronger. So I've, I've kind of... I used to talk to food business about that. I went to... Another food business the other day, uh, really nice board. I went, I, they asked me to speak at their annual board day, and I talked about the junk food cycle, and they were like, 
yeah, but, you know, we, we've got good, true, we've got good cereals, we've got, you know, mueslis, and we don't have any kind of, you know, high sugar cereals. And I knew they were going to say this, so I said, look, here is your, the last ten products you have released. And they were all like muesli with chocolate bits in it, wheat cereal frosted, wheat cereal with chocolate bits in it frosted. And I said, you may be, you know, you may be on the outside of the junk food cycle, but this is you, this is you being sucked in. And they were like, mm, yeah, fair enough. changes in culture and society where it's very, very difficult to know who the kind of agent of change is. If you look at, I don't know, a typical high street where there are any number of um, uh, junk food stores there, or where you take, you know, the fact that, um, you know, when I was a child growing up, the number of coffee shops around was very limited, they closed, they had closing hours, and the type of coffee that people drank was just like coffee with a splash of milk, but now it's a latte, and it's a super-sized latte, and that the, you cannot go through, we have a kind of snacking 24-7, 365 days culture of ubiquitous food, and, and who is responsible for this? Is it planning departments? At which level? Is it, do you see what I mean? It's, yep. it's seeped into our modes of living, really. Yeah, and, 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 it, and it is, that's the problem, it's, it's, it's deeply cultural, but, but, so we have a significantly worse food culture than most of the rest of Europe. 57% of the food we eat is ultra-processed. In France and Spain and Italy, it's in the mid-teens. So they haven't slipped into the problem in the way that, although they are moving in that direction. And you can debate a lot about why, why that is. I think probably the argument that it stems from the Industrial Revolution, when we moved our population into cities... Before the Second World War, we produced only 30% of our food. France didn't have the same level of urbanization, population living in urban areas until the late 60s. You know, and we basically stopped producing food and started producing cloth and then selling it. And so we lost our food culture then. Anyway. But one of the things that we go into in some detail in the book is that the other thing that does need to change is our culture. We need to start cooking from scratch again. We need to start valuing food. Parenthesis, not in my scope, we need to be less unequal. We need, poverty is a huge problem, but we talk about that. But that's, you know, uh, there are ways in which you can help, but in the end, you need to solve that problem. It's a different problem. But actually, cultural change is, I think, possible. I think it is a mistake to think the genie's out of the bottle, it's never going to go back in, because cultures change all the time. Um, you know, if you imagine what it was like for us growing up in the 70s, everyone smoked. You know, I, I, um, I uh, saw Tony Blair talking the other day, and he was like, everyone told me when we banned smoking that it was going to lose us all these votes in the Red Wall, and I was going to... Uh, and, like, yeah. And people came up to me in Grimsby and said, oh, thank God, you know, I don't smell of cigarettes when I, you know... And, and then if you look at our food culture, you know, in restaurants, and I don't think this is trivial, that has improved hugely. Uh, and then if you look at, say, Japan, and we give the example of Japan and South Korea in the book, you know, a lot of the things they did, they have actively, governments have changed their food culture. My favourite, kind of, it started in the Meiji Restoration at the end of the 19th century when they opened up. And the Chinese and the Dutch came in to trade with them. They were like, oh, my God, these people are huge. Well, you know, what are we going to do about it? And, the, and the, um, the emperor started eating red meat, which was taboo at the time. They got the army chef to create a whole new menu for the army, uh, and then, which is interesting, quite similar to the Boer War, which was a big wake-up call for us. When our soldiers went to the Boer War, they were so impoverished that we introduced free school meals and food programmes and that kind of thing. So they introduced army chefs. The army chefs spoke on the radio. A lot of their dishes that we think of this kind of perfectly landed Japanese culture. Katsu curry, is, as you know, is a dish taken from the British naval ships. It was a fried chicken with an Indian curry sauce. And the Japanese stole it from us, our great contribution to world cuisine. Um, so I think you can, and there are all sorts of... So I think we mustn't give up on that. We have to, you know, yes, you intervene, but in the end, it's going to be cultural change. And I, I think there is a perfectly 
imaginable world in 50 years' time when we look back and think, fuck, those were the days when we ate that shit. You know, I think that is a perfectly reasonable world to imagine. I don't think it is necessarily the case that it just gets more and more processed. drive the cultural change and people who say, oh, it's these, you know, poor people who have a poor food culture and it's somehow essentializing the, the kind of the culture of it. And I think the other point I would also make is that there is, when one thinks about culture and going back to cooking and blah, 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 that sort of thing, I'm all signed up for that, it's really important. But it can also overlap in potentially sinister ways with, for example, the rise of the far right. In, in say Italy, which has banned investment in alternative proteins, and but as as sort of junk food threatening yeah. threatening their culture. So I think I think there's a lot of complexity. But I'm going to. You're telling me. You Can I ask you a question? So I th so on the poverty thing, I don't, I it is clearly much harder to not impossible, but much harder to eat well in poverty. But we're going to a lot of reasons. If you have the skill, you have to buy in bulk, you might not have the kit, you're worried that your child won't eat what you give them and you can't afford it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that curing, if you were able to cure poverty, um, it's not going in the right direction at the moment, that is necessary, but I don't think in any way it's sufficient. No, I agree, I agree. Uh, and I think that you know, one, of the other, one of the recommendations we made, which is interestingly interesting to me, uh, some people like it, some, both on the left and right are suspicious of it. If you give benefits in the form of good food, whether that is subtly through free school meals or holiday activity and food programmes, or less subtly, so the Alexander Rose Foundation gives children, parent, families living in poverty in Hackney near me, eight pound fruit and veg vouchers. The results in terms of the change in their diet are astonishing. But some people on the left will say, well, that's demeaning, you should be giving money. And on the right, they'll be saying, why are you giving them it? So I, it's just like, you think that for me, that it's just so obvious that if, when you give an eight pound fruit and veg voucher to a family, the parents are insanely grateful, the children eat, go from 7% eating five a day to 64%. And the reason the family feel grateful is, this, is if you give money, and I've talked to people in this situation, there are polls on this. So you worry that by, say, the kind of simple act of putting a fruit bowl on the table, you are squandering resources and you feel guilty if a child doesn't eat it, you know, because you're constantly balancing your budget. And so you actually take, I think, oh, well, certainly the review, the, the work that Alex wrote, you take a weight off people's mind. They said the parents say they sleep better, feel less yeah. stressed, really interesting. Yeah. Sorry, it's it's the point where people are um, generally surveys show that people are more in favour of increases in taxation if they know that the money is going to be um, kind of ring fence for I know children's yeah. physical activity. Yeah. But I know you have a lot of questions, so um, go go for it. Hi. Do do you need a mic or? Hi, thank you so much. Um, it was so informative. Um, I do not work in kind of food system or policy anything. I'm totally in something else, but if we all eat and we all live, so you know, it's of great importance. I wanted to ask a little bit more detailed about the sugar tax. Mm -hmm. So accent, I'm from the US, uh, moved here, and know there's a sugar tax, but then looked at the sodas, you can't find a soda without that doesn't have artificial sweeteners in it. So it was yeah. instead of actually lowering the sweetness, it was just let mm. us put fake things in. And artificial sweeteners are incredibly, incredibly bad for um, brain activity, particularly those with mental health conditions. So going back to this feedback loop of you know, health and diet, what is there as far, you know, do we need taxation need to say, yeah, but you can't just add this as a workaround. Yeah. So the, 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 sugary, the sugary drinks tax, sugary drinks industry levy, which is in place, uh, taxes sugary drinks based on various levels of 
hurdles of sugar. And what's happened since it was introduced is 45,000 tons of sugar have been taken out of soft drinks. Uh, a lot of that sugar, not all of it, has been replaced by sweeteners. You've seen, uh, like, if you look at the levels of sugar in sugary drinks, they sit just beneath each of those thresholds. Um, the, if you set aside mental health, the, in France they have a similar thing, but they, they do it for sweeteners as well. So it's both. The people in the, U in the UK, the science still shows, people say, well, it gives you a sweet palate, but actually double blind, people do eat fewer calories if they're on, um, if they're on uh, drinks of sweeteners rather than uh, drinks of sugar. There was, there's an argument that people make up for it elsewhere, but that doesn't seem to be the case. But definitely the jury is out on artificial sweeteners and the evidence is building up that they might not be a good thing. Interestingly, what also what that seems to have done, I was written to by one of the big sugary drinks companies saying, we support rolling this out over all foodstuffs. Um, and uh, we, I think that is because I think quite a lot of sugar might have moved from sugary drinks into, like, literally people were, instead of drinking drinks, were eating more sweets. So, like, there was a share of sugar that was changing. The, the, the sugar and salt reformulation levy that we proposed was on bulk buying of sugar and salt, so you wouldn't have that tier effect, and it was across all products. And we... Bulk buying by the manufacturer. By, by the manufacturer. So if you, you, could, you could make your own, you could buy a thing of sugar in the, in the store and you wouldn't be taxed. And the Art Institute of Fiscal Studies did work and they thought that would shift a lot of production. We slightly fudged the question on... A lot of those... Some of those products would be quite difficult to sweeten, but we slightly fudged the question. So we said, if the evidence turns out to be the case that sweeteners, then they should be included. But I do think that that is the... That kind of pure tax, there are other things, is one of the few things that you can do. You know, tax works. We know that tax works. You, you know, you put up tax on fuel, people drive less, you know. So there are all sorts of ways with these. I mean, I thought we, we were talking about this earlier on. So in a complex, take that sugary drinks levy, in a complex system, one of the problems with this is it literally, you cannot say you know what will happen when you do something to it. So you can have a good guess, and you can have a good guess of what might happen, but you don't know. And businesses, they, what they do is they have a guess, they do something. If that doesn't work, they do something else. If that doesn't work, they do something else. States... They're very slow. They're very yeah. slow. They do something, and then they spend another six years working out how that's worked and whether it's going to work, etc. and then they do something else. And the, pretty much the only example in public health where that hasn't happened, and it's an example we use in the book, is a man called Pekka Pasker in Finland. Finland had the worst, by far the worst coronary heart disease rates in the world in the 70s. Their men were dying at the age of 45, 50. Uh, they'd all come back from uh, the war smoking, and they were all given little bits of land, and they didn't know how to grow anything, so they had pigs, and basically they ate pigs and salt and smoked. And uh, the... the the, the, the head of uh, public health at the time said, I, I, we spoke to him and he said, I, we got so fed up with scientists from all around the world coming and sticking needles in us to try and work out why we're so unhealthy. We, we need to do something about it. And they found this young doctor called Pekka Pasco. And one of the reasons they chose him was because he was young and they thought that it might take quite a long time to, to solve. And he did everything all at once. So rather than what he said... And he was criticised by other scientists because he said, how can we tell what worked? Like, we can't, we can't compare. We don't know what you did. But he said, I'm sorry, we're just going to do everything. He called it having boots deep in the mud. And so they did everything from... They set up cooperatives to freeze berries from the summer so that people could eat them in the winter. They completely changed the food served in schools. They, had, uh, they taught the women, and it was mostly women, how you added vegetables to soup to uh, like get more vegetables in their diet. They worked with the sausage manufacturers to put mushrooms in to reduce the fat and the salt in them. You know, they did everything. They, they lit ski paths. They gave old people snowshoes. They had a TV competition where, like, who was the fittest village, which was the most watched at one point, the most watched <laughs> Finnish TV show amongst uh, adult men. 
And it's the one, you know, we need a bit more of that, of like just doing stuff, because if you do things one by one... But I have a slightly different view on the sugary drinks tax. I mean, I, I think we certainly need taxation, but when it comes to sugary drinks, I feel this is an example of tackling one issue, which yeah. is sugar. Um, you're still not changing the business model, which is about um, selling water with a bit of flavouring in plastic bottles and, and shifting it around at a great environmental expense. I mean, not great relative to, say, meat consumption, but this is kind of fairly unnecessary. And if you look, again, s sort of systemically at some of the, the factors that have kind of shifted in, in conjunction with that, we have seen the decline of, for example, free drinking, so, um, water fountains, so the privatisation of public sources of hydration, so to speak, same in Luz. Um, and, and you see things like the, the ongoing kind of refrigerization of all aspects of our lives. And of course, refrigeration now is much more energy efficient than it used to be, but it's so much more ubiquitous. I mean, going back to when I was a, you know, a little girl, you would, um, you would buy Ribena and you would dilute it yourself. And I remember when I saw a ready-to-drink like Ribena yeah. carton, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought, That's what? So weird. And, but now, of course, I don't think twice about it because it's just, it's a kind of normality of refrigerated water because we maybe we have been told that this is could be and so so I think there are so many factors that are compounding um, yeah. the kind of the fact that now this is hailed as a solution, but it, it's just it's just kind of taking one piece of straw off the pile, really. What do you think about uh, my daughter now spends all of her pocket money having bought one of those bottles with the scented tops? Have you tried those? A scented. Top. So you get a water bottle. And you get a little thing. It's a bit like an espresso capsule, but it contains a scent. And you click it on top of the water bottle. You fill it with water from the tap. Yeah, I see. And then when you suck it in, the scent goes into your so nose. Like so the water. So the so the well, is it? So, I mean, so the water yeah. tastes peachy oh or God. strawberry. So they're eating yeah. tap water. And I'm very conflicted yeah. about it. I think yeah, it's I like. Can, can but at the same it. time, I'd rather her do that than. Yeah. I, the, I, I the, but a it's a simple solution there. Yeah. Who's got another? Oh my God. Um, the lady in blue was first, actually. Thank you. Um, so thinking from a, a broader systemic perspective globally and thinking about things like what the quinoa trend did in South America and just because a practice might be illegal or unacceptable in one country, perhaps it shifts elsewhere. Just really curious on your thoughts about how changing in the UK can go hand in hand with global change rather than just shifting the issues elsewhere in the world. So are you talking, just to clarify, are you talking about things like, um, I don't know, if we cut back on meat, we might just export more of our meat, that kind of thing? Yeah, so the, the, the trends that happen here impacting kind of, you know, unintentional change elsewhere or corporates still being able to do the what the, the same practices where the legislation might not be yeah. so strict. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tackle that on environment and then on health because they're very, they're very different. Uh, we are, we're f still the fifth biggest economy in the world. I think we're, the, we're, we're bigger in terms of our food market. We buy a lot of food. We're one of the most attractive food markets in the world because we're so deregulated and we sell 57% of the food we sell is processed. Um, so on the environmental side... I think it makes a lot of sense to try to create a far... to prove that you can create a net zero, biodiversity, positive farming system in the UK. But you, it only makes sense if you get your trade deals right. So I've been repeatedly very critical of Liz Truss's Australian trade deal because there's no point in doing that and then import... Uh, and animal welfare friendly, and then importing things that are produced, you know, basically exporting your animal cruelty to somewhere you can't see it or exporting your carbon to somewhere you can't see it. Now, the reality of that trade deal is m most of their food they export to Asia and to China. So unless they have a trade war with China, it's probably not going to be a big problem. And it looks like other trade deals with the states and Mercosur nations are gonna, not going to happen for a long time. But that is my concern, is that you have that release valve. On health, 
and we're so far off solving it in this country. There, are, I mean, the, the only the, there are the only countries who have there are countries who have slowed down the problem. South Korea and Japan are the two that are kind of most cited. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure that you can kind of export health problems. Really, I think no, everyone has to deal with some it. of the big companies. I remember talking to one of the big big dairy companies actually, and it was showing me all the fabulous stuff it was doing in the Scandi nations. And then I say, okay, so what, what are you doing in Vietnam? And the, the standards are different. Oh, on on environment or on? You know, it was on health. It yeah. was like you know a bit more sugar, prop things up with a bit of palm oil. You know, it was that, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. I mean, there's what I don't deal with in the book. It is very much focused on um, on the Western food systems, and there's a whole different set of issues. Um, it's a completely different set of issues for developing countries because they're completely different economic structures. And then, obviously, when you're talking about inequality. Um, you know, you get to that huge question when we're dealing with global things about why do I care about inequality in the UK when actually global inequality is much bigger, and then you get onto discussions about identity and nationhood, and, blah, 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 blah. and I didn't really get that's kind of that's beyond my. I get I, I, I get that by I get that from when I listen to, to Helen Thompson's podcast, but I can't, I'm not clever enough to think about that stuff. There's another question. Uh, it, there was one. Man at the back, as I noticed last time, and then I'll go back to that side and go back to the side. Thank you, um, Henry. I, th I suppose I thought that the the government response to the excellent national food strategy was a was a bit disappointing, and um, we've heard a bit about anecdotes tonight about ITV and CEO of Nestle and so forth. And in my position in the food sector as a farmer, you see the pace of change is sort of unbelievably slow, and and the and the resistance towards change uh, being very high. Um, so my, my question was going to be really, you know, do you think this is really politically doable? I, I suspect the answer is yes, from based on what you've been saying tonight. And if that is the answer, how long is it going to take to, to get this in place, to fix these sorts of issues across the board? So again, I think you have to divide the two things, my personal view. So I, I, think, that the, I think that it is more likely than not that the health problem will be fixed in the short term by semaglutide, which is the first of these appetite-suppressing drugs, uh, branded as Wagovi and as Empic. There are lots of It's the Prozac of them. I, I know of at least four or five that are in development. And I think it is more likely than not that we will end up with a lot of people on drugs. I am pessimistic on health. I'm actually quite optimistic on environment. Uh, I know that... So, you know, if you think about where we've got an environment in that chaos... You know, yes, you as a farmer, you know, you had Gove and then Eustace quite carefully, slowly, but quite carefully rolling things out. And then it got completely blown up by the trust administration and, and trust has completely got the levels of trust now. It's a, you know, it made you realise how difficult it was to land that when you see how quickly those trusts were destroyed. But I, do, I don't think we're going to go back on that. I do think that is going to work. And if you look at... Even now, you know, you will, most people might not look at this. The way, you know, as I said, you don't know what an intervention is going to do. You don't know if the, 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 sorry, I should step back. The Future Farming Programme is uh, trying, one of the few things that everyone agreed could be a benefit of Brexit was getting out of the common agricultural policy. Except, funny enough, for Peter Mandelson, but that's a different story. Um, he's a big fan of the common agricultural policy. Um, and what the government was trying to do was instead of paying people to produce food, we pay about £3.4 billion a year to farmers across the UK, £2.4 in, the, in England, was to pay public money for public goods. So you pay them for restoring biodiversity, for sequestering carbon, for improving soils, and you raise regulation. And that is very, that is like a hugely difficult thing to do when you have farmers changing large amounts of payments and they got quite a lot of it wrong but they're changing it all the time and they're tweaking it and I think that the I really think that the will is there to make that change so I'm opt I am optimistic I think that Daniel Zeitner who is the will, will be the minister for farming if Labour get in also gets it so I am I'm optimistic on that but on health I'm very pessimistic are we on the last yeah okay well last question and 
to um, yeah, it is you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you both for that. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture just approved um, yes. cultivated meat in the U.S. Uh, I'm really struck by the map that you had on the land use in the U.K., and I'm, um, I'd like to get both of your takes on to what extent do you see that? Or first of all, are you excited by it? And um, if you are, to what extent? And how do you see that changing the land use map and moving some of that land back to um, plant production rather than um, yep. animals and animal feed? So this is a topic that both of us have spent a lot of time thinking and talking about. I had actually on, what are we now? M Thursday. Yes. On Tuesday, I had for lunch uh, a, a cheese that was made from precision fermented um, uh, proteins. So that was, they'd taken a, a fungi and they had genetically edited it to make some of the proteins that exist in cheese, and then they had taken those, mixed them with some fat and some other things, and then they had made the cheese and the normal thing. And actually, the feta, I don't think you would have noticed. First thing I've tasted, I don't think... I mean, you would have, it wouldn't have gone, wow, that's the most amazing feta, but you would have just eaten it. The other one was... But, you know. And then tomorrow, I'm going to, uh, for breakfast, uh, for, to a dog food company. I hope I'm not going to have to eat the dog food, but... I'm going to a dog food company that is man using cellular grown meat to put into dog food because they think that actually the owners of dogs we prepared to pay the margin, vegan dog owners. Anyway, so I think that it is, there are two, I think most of that initially will go into ultra-processed foods. 50% of the meat that we eat is uh, eaten in the form of mince uh, in kind of processed foods. Um, China, 60% of the dairy that it imports is in the form of milk powder. I cannot see any world in which as soon as the cost of producing, fermenting the same proteins that are in milk powder comes below dairy, that you would have a heavy ruminant wandering around and use all the energy to, to do its milk. So I think it will happen in processed food. Some of that will be as unhealthy as the foods that it replaces, but I think you have. I think that is a necessary trade-off. I think you have to use the fact that we have all of that processed food to make our food maybe not much more healthy, but a whole free up a whole bit of land. So I am generally quite. I'm more positive than some people. Some people say, "Why can't we just eat lentils?" And you know, some people say, "What's the answer?" And the answer is. You know, if you like, the answer is chickpeas. If you could fucking get people to eat them, but that is, but that is, that is, that is, a, that is amazing. I mean, that literally is the answer, well, isn't actually, it? Actually, the answer is legumes. Um, I think it's carrots, cabbage, legumes, yeah. and mussels. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, uh, it's basically vegetable soup. Yeah, with that is with, with some with some but, with yeah. some legumes and mussels. Yes, don't forget the mussels. Mussels are, by the way, if you pretty much the only like the bivalves yeah. are the only are the only things that we can guarantee don't feel pain but but i think i i mean i i have a sort of a slightly more ambivalent not not i mean i think it depends where you're coming from so alternative proteins if we're talking about the like 80 billion and the numbers are out of date there because they go up out of date every second of animals that suffer and slaughter then eliminating that suffering is 100% a good thing. I think what some of the concerns are about alternative proteins is who is investing in them, who is profiting in them, what's the business model, and what is the model of consumption that, that they, they kind of support and prop up. Um, so I think insofar as they don't challenge the kind of existing power structures I think I think there are some questions and then people say well you can make it open source technology you can have sort of little like kind of cottage brewery type setups but look at look what's happened to craft breweries in the UK they're all owned by you know Diageo or whatever so I mean I think I think there is that concern um, and then there are the people who say why don't we just get back to looking at using animals for what they're good at, which is recycling nutrients within the food system. And if we constrained our consumption to, to, to what is available from that, that is a better option. But then it still raises the question of land and how much land are we going to allocate to those systems of production. So I think, long story short, on alternative proteins, 
what I what I what concerns me most is the level of polarization and discussions that they're kind of the work of the devil or the solution to everything. And I think as Henry has pointed out so very, very clearly, there isn't a solution. There are lots of bits of activity that is needed. And I think the challenge is to make sure that one thing and one answer doesn't dominate because we need that multiplicity of approaches in tension with one another to make sure that we don't put all our I'm mixing my metaphors here, but eggs in one basket. So, yeah. Anyway, I know we're out of time, aren't we? Um, so, uh, do you want to like tie this all up with a beautiful bow? No, I just want to say, have a drink. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Um, the, we wrote the book to be like a thriller, to be like really fast-paced. And my wife is a wonderful writer, so do you know, if you don't want to read it, give a copy to a friend. Yeah. The idea is to spread the word. Yeah, it's a great book. I recommend it. Thank you.